Greetings and welcome to another conversation from the Sheikh Talal Hari Foundation. Today we have a continuation of a conversation that was started between Richard Esco and Sheikh Talal Hari on deep time and human history. It was triggered off by an interesting conversation between Yuval Harari in conversation with Posna, and it, it, it generated a few more questions amongst people who had watched it, who are also interested in Sheikh Falala's work. And Richard posed some questions to him um, arising out of that. Now, I had introduced before Richard. He is a well-known writer and commentary and political analyst and hosts a radio podcast and is commentator on TV. And Sheikh Falala Hairi, as you well know, is a contemporary sage steeped in Islamic and Sufi uh, teachings and is able to to transmit and translate um, what is often regarded as traditional uh, spiritual knowledge into a modern day idiom with strong references to quantum science and co consciousness studies. So I will hand it over to Richard to pose these questions. There's more questions that have come uh, since then uh, that have been sent in by listeners. And uh, Richard, I'm sure you will also add to that your own furthering uh, of a nuanced discussion with Sheikh Fadlala. Thank you so much, Bismillah. I'll do my best. And once again, thank you, Sheikh Fadala, for taking the time to answer these questions and address these issues. And I have twice the responsibility this time because I, I not only have to be of, of service to you to the best of my ability, but to the questioners as well to try to convey uh, what it is they wanted to know. So I will do it to the best of my ability, Bismillah. Um, the first question that we received, Sheikh Fadlala, um, I'll paraphrase slightly, but um, but uh, the, the writer says, um, uh, I know we are hanging on air, our lungs could collapse, we could be taken by an invisible virus, so it's better to forgive grievances and move on freely. But uh, the writer goes on to say, uh, to talk about blockages that someone experienced in their life uh, because of their inability to forgive uh, relatives, family members who had mistreated other family members. And I, I believe the concern was, you know, as we move on into the next phase of existence, uh, do these blockages, these whatever we want to call them, these burdens, these weights that we carry, do they fall off? How do we release ourselves from them uh, and stop carrying them in this life and perhaps into the next? I present you and share with you a very simple model. And that is a situation where each one of us, individually and collectively, covers two zones of consciousnesses. There are two. Whatever we experience in this life is one of two, emanating from the one, by grace of one, so as through intelligence, through investigation, through search, through conviction, we see the one behind the two, within the two, before the two, and after the two. Now, all of this business of reforming, correcting, healing, this is all to do with the zone of consciousness in duality. It is where we have to grapple with. But this is only a tiny bit of light emanating from the original cosmic, all-encompassing, all-permeating consciousness, which is, if you like, you call it a quantum zone. It is not subject to space and time. So, once I am within space and time, I have to reconcile, I have to investigate, I have to heal, I have to improve on, I have to make a decision, I have to make a judgment, sometimes it's out of context, and on and on and on. But if I refer to the original zone, the all-encompassing zone of consciousness, the divine zone of consciousness, the universal cosmic zone of consciousness, divine consciousness, then there are no such things. There's only perfection upon perfection upon perfection ad infinitum. So I, as a human being, between these two, if you like, 
extreme, extremes. One is beyond the mind to comprehend. The mind is a result of a beam from the conditioned consciousness. So how can it understand cosmic consciousness? It can't. So you have to leave the mind aside. The mind is an important faculty to deal with the ever-changing world of duality, which is outside and inside, which is micro and macro. That's what the mind is for. But if I want truth, reality, stability, honesty, reality, uh, all of the other things that we, are, we hanker for, you have to calm the mind, make peace with it, and leave it down for a while and transcend into that zone if by grace is possible. Otherwise, you still remain in this zone. You have imagination, you have creativity, all kinds of things emerge to you. And at the end, you think you are the most special. In reality, of course, every soul is the most special because it's emerging from a cosmic zone of supraordinary reality of truth, of you like the light of God. Every soul is sacred, so it is extra special. But once you say it is mine, then you have in every way contaminated it. It's not yours. The so-called you belong to it. So in order to have that true contentment beyond ease, you need to be able to switch off your mind. And that's why we are here to practice that through higher intelligence. And I, I'm sure there are those listening, Sheikh Fadala, who are thinking right now with their minds, how do I switch off my mind? And in other words, circling, right? Uh, it seems to me like a dog chases its tail. It's The dog is chasing the dog. The mind is chasing the mind. People are wondering, perhaps, uh, um, because this question came up in my own household, how how do you switch off the mind without further engaging the mind? What is the way to do that? Again, the two forces come into play. One is me. I have to quieten the mind through ease, through comfort, through lack of fear, lack of anxiety, not too much food, no hunger, no insecurity, whatever, whatever, through pleasant atmosphere to raise, if you like, the level of consciousness, to raise also what you may term as high frequency of the presence you are in. And you can lull it through sound, through music, through chanting, through religious practices, and through all kinds of techniques. Yoga helps a lot, everything helps, until you are at the point where you're about to enter what you may even term as self-hypnosis, losing yourself. We love that. Everybody loves the point in which you lose yourself. A child does it through frantic dancing, chanting, jumping, taking everything to its extreme end. Until such time, you're no longer you. Even the great sportsmen, they, a very famous, uh, you know, fast car driver says, I love it because a point reaches that I'm no longer able to do anything. I, I go beyond me. Then I feel I'm sitting in the lap of God. He was actually a very <laughs> Christian believer. He said, that is the only time I really am in best worship. I lose everything and I know God is taking care of me. Anyway, so any technique that helps you to quieten the mind, how can I be at peace and at ease when I know there are one horde of, if you like, attackers from one side and the other side there is a volcano is about to erupt and on top of me hail is coming. It's not possible. The mind is there to ensure the protection of life, the protection of my soul through also me as an agent. So I will immediately respond to defend myself. I will have an autonomic system, which occupies maybe 20, 30, 40% of energy in order to make sure that I survive. It is to honor life, which is living forever. 
So we are all enslaved anyway, with the most magnificent way. And we are obsessed with life. Life is forever, has no beginning nor end. My life has, has a birth and also culminates with death. The more I associate myself with me, the more I am caught in this undesirable cul-de-sac. The more I realize that the real me is only the outer manifestation of a reality that is not separate from infinite life itself. That is why I'm here. If there is a purpose of life, is that to perfect that unison between the so-called I, the image, the, if you like, outer appearance, the shadow, and the light itself, which is eternal. That is why human being is sacred in essence. Soul is sacred. If you attack it because it has manifested this way, then you are attacking the sacred. Mm. And that is cosmic. In other words, you are attacking everything that's alive. So the cosmology that I know and I live by is very simple. That the real me is two. One is an eternal light that can only be discerned through its shadow. And therefore, the me arrives as a shadow. And in Christian, in Christian teachings and many other world religious teachings, man is the shadow of God on earth and so on and so on. That means there is within me and you and her, every human being, everything that's alive, there is a touch of life. And that is cosmic and sacred. And from it arises the outer world, the experience, modified, conditioned, and so on. So the rat is not the same as an elephant, not the same as a human being, but they all share the touch of this mysterious power we call life. For, uh, I'm reminded for some reason, Sheikh Falala, of uh, what a, a music instructor told me once. Every musician who, especially in improvisational music, has experienced moments where they're playing at a level they didn't realize they were capable of. And both in terms of imagination and just in terms of mind, body, uh, skill. And these moments come and they go, and you know, there's the expression in the zone, I'm in the, you know, he was in the zone, or whether they describe it that way. And this music teacher said, those rare, rare, rare moments in your musical life, that's how you play. You don't play the mediocre way you think you play or the level, the, these extraordinary leaps you've achieved. I don't know if he's right or wrong, his theory was, that is you, that is how you play. Is that in any way relevant to what you were just saying? Very, 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 very. The real you is that light which is not constrained, which is ever perfect. And it is not rare, rare either. The less you identify with the so-called you, the more that reality will prevail upon you. And that is the real you. You are not God, you're godly and God has taken over and there is no longer the separation between I and it. I am here to reconcile this illusion that I am separate and I'm given this limited power. I can do this, I can cause havoc, I can bring in goodness, otherwise I have a project. Until you lose any idea of any project, you lose it all until it is the winner. Quran and all other scriptures remind us regularly that there is no victory, victorious, lasting reality, except reality itself, which is beyond time and space. From it arises this amazing gift of space and time. So this is another womb. There is one mother's womb, and then there is the earthly womb, which we call space and time. So it's double, double, double. The mother's womb, I was ejected. She couldn't take it anymore. And it had to be natural, if you like, to be no more dependent upon a defining person. Now you are dependent on air, water, others, food, other people. So now you are in the second womb, 
which is the earthly limitation of space and time. And each one of us tries to break through that. Well, people feel that boxed in effect. People getting angry, people are very unhappy because our real nature, nature my so-called shadow nature, my or ego. I want to go beyond any boundaries. I want to push boundaries as far as they can. That's why parents are very concerned about children because it's in their nature to push boundaries and they can cause themselves much danger or grievance or situations that they cannot get, get out of and so on and so forth. So our real nature, original nature, permanent nature is divine, boundless. But our temporary transitory nature is limited and contained and conditioned and is yearning for its origin, is yearning for infinitude is yearning for those who believe in God in being in the total divine precinct. There is only the divine in truth. Everything else emanating from it, including the shadow. <laughs> so there is only that truth. There is only divine lights that contain the known and the unknown. And the web is enormous. It's cosmic. And it contains at our level, all the so-called divine attributes and names, all the things that we love, we are obsessed with the divine. So all what there is that is admitted, understand it, give in to it, and have a good time. This life on earth can be a part of paradise, or it can be part of hell. And a lot of that depends on my attitude and fine-tuning to the light within it. I can be in this earth at such a state of sublime joy that is not describable. I can equally, if I succumb to the shadow of the shadows within me, I can become the most awful, impossible, egotistic, narcissistic, all kinds of other things that only cause damage. And we have experiences of that at every level. And evolution is such an amazing gift that has been moving on and on and on towards the ultimate destiny of the cosmic oneness from which we are not separate in reality, but we think we are separate because of thinking. Thank you. Uh, the next question from Andy goes back to uh, Yuval Harari, our original inspiration for these conversations. Yuval Harari, the historian uh, and author of books on the sweep of human history. Uh, Andy writes that many of Harari's books uh, rely on the argument that human beings have mythic narratives and that they exist only in the collective imagination. There's no, uh, I assume Andy means no uh, objective reality to them. And, the, and Harari's theory as a as materialist kind of thinker is that these mythic narratives have evolved as an efficient way for humans to organize themselves and that the one thing these narratives don't admit is that some of their ideals might be religion, might be democracy, might be uh, capitalism, uh, is that they're fictional, they're not real. And so uh, Andy writes, what is the basis in your experience by which you differentiate between such shared stories and truth and truth, the meaning, you know, as I interpret it, uh, how do we know what's mythology and how do we know it's fundamental truth, reality beneath reality? Fundamental truth, the absolute truth, cannot be described or talked about. It is like the quantum field. Find somebody who can really give you a full definition, understanding, and to teach you about quantum reality. But everything that exists has a touch of that reality. That is where it is. So there are zillions of different levels, if you like, of truth, until you reach truth itself, and then 
it's another zone that the tongue or the mind or sharing and caring cannot exist. It is absolute, it's eternal, it's beyond space and time. From it, every tiny fraction of space and time emerges. So that is how it is. Everything has a touch of reality. So it is, in many cases, we are ourselves mythic, myth makers. We like that. We love, we love romantic ideas. We exaggerate. Why do we exaggerate? Because the truth is beyond, is greater, is akbar. Greater, greater, that means it's not great, it's not greatest, it's greater, greater, endless. That is what it is. So in a way that's correct. We are as human beings grappling within many zones of realities with different intensities and different, if you like, clarities, all of them emanating from this one eternal cosmic reality and returning back to it. And if I am to recalibrate my own myths, illusions, delusions, I need to stop everything in my mind and touch, allow by grace, not I can't do it, you can't do it. I can only take away the debris and in the interfering factors, but that eternal light will shine when it is appropriate. It's like a fire, you prepare for it. You prepare whatever it is, the heat and the thing and the ability to, sp to spark uh, thing. And then it has to take on itself. It knows when it is able to ignite and it has to be fed because it's within duality. So a fire has to be fed. And when it is not and so on, it decides again to disappear like the quantum field, doesn't show. So, but it's always there. Same thing as souls or spirits. They're all there, but they don't show because the appropriate vehicle for their descent onto earth or the appropriate anchor is not there. So it doesn't happen. But once it is there, then it happens and a baby mouse emerges or a bird or a human being and for a little while and all the time questioning, who am I? Who are you? How can I not have everything all the time? Asking about the quantum zone itself. There's everything in it all the time and in no time. And there is nothing that you can discern. So we have to reconcile the bounded, the limited with the boundless. That is the human purpose. And that is, if you like, all serious investigations, philosophical, spiritual, religious, or otherwise, come to that point. That individually, we need to reconcile the absolute truth, which you cannot do anything other than smile about and be in joy, eternal joy, joyfulness about, and the limited truth. Say, look here, this will change. The season has come, the season will go. You are strong now, but you'll be weak. You like this thing now, a day may come, you don't like it, and so on and so on. Duality, good and bad, up and down, attraction and repulsion. So this is the same, it's the same. We cannot live in this life unless there is a promise of that something which is beyond eternal, constant, perpetual. Otherwise, there will be no hope. All our relative earthly hopes are based on essentially the wish, the desire, the inner secret that I one day will know there is that eternal light that's caused my life. And that is beyond security and insecurity. So I now go beyond singing the essence of the music itself. Thank you. And uh, Andy goes on to say, uh, Harari says we're a storytelling species, uh, which may, seems reasonable I, to me. While the, he says, while the tales we tell today may just be variations of the same stories as those told through deep time, what do you think of all the new means we have to share them? And I assume by that he means, uh, you know, internet, email, Twitter, uh, Facebook, um, that it connects everyone, virtually everyone, uh, but is also designed to encourage conflict and clicking on, and that sort of thing, so. There is an underlying presumption there 
that life didn't exist before Facebook. <laughs> As though people didn't question life, enjoy life, suffer from life and so on before them. We are into a, a short period of human life of fads and fashions, and they won't last. Soon, I think we'll come back to the, that essential question as to why can't you, I, he or she, be able to touch a button or a zone that is constant in its goodness and in its happiness. And this is raining on top of us here, so you must excuse the sound. It's, it's again grace. When it rains, there is grace. When there isn't, it's a grace for us to look for other types of grace. So we have to be cautious regarding the so-called modern time we are living in. We have become too dependent on uh, dualities and the mechanistic way of dividing yea or nay and all of the other things rather than practicing the art of stopping anything to do with the mind. Hmm. All of these issues of big history or this analysis, all of these are helpful to our present situation. But what about 200 years ago, 5,000 years ago, a million years ago? There was still life, there were billions of years. So we need to practice the art of freezing time. We're already dependent on it in an autonomic way when we go deep sleep. So why can't you do it once you are awake with will, with God's grace, with a bit of practice, silence, empty, stop it, concentrate on the breath or any other way and touch the zone of timelessness. That's essential for health, actually. It recalibrates everything. So although many contemporary teachers and others who have managed to encapsulate for us science, history, physiology, by all of these things, it's helpful. But I think we have to transcend all of this and depend on your inner core and touch regularly that absolute silence. The best way you can describe it is bliss. Indescribable bliss. Hmm. That's it. I have a question of my own, Sheikh Vidlala, related to this. Uh, so I won't, I won't blame anyone for this question, but uh, I wrote about um, a Buddhist conference some years ago uh, conference of Buddhists. I got in some trouble for my observations, but they talked a lot about, uh, virtually exclusively, about brain physiology and and how to achieve meditative states and what the uh, magnetic resonance imaging, all of which is quite interesting. I, I don't dis dismiss it, but uh, one of the uh, Buddhist teachers who had been doing it quite a long time, they talk about enlightenment, you know, as if it were sort of binary. It, you either have it or you don't. You're enlightened or you're not. And this guy was saying, someday we'll have an app that uh, you attach electrodes to your brain, you press a button or, or your smartphone and click, you're enlightened. And I guess my, I would have a twofold question for you about that related to this last question, which is, is such a thing imaginable, you think? And if there were what, such a device, uh, would it be cheating, for lack of a better word, uh, or, or to, to even do it? Or is it something a person should just achieve through their own work, discipline, whatever you want to call it? There are many such devices, hundreds have been also with humanity. And one of the biggest, most prevalent devices now, they are drugs mm. and all other <laughs> factors that can induce change the chemistry of your mind. Now, enlightenment to me means nothing other than touching the zone of infinitude in you. Nothing more, nothing less. It doesn't put you above anybody, it doesn't put you below anybody. It just gives you an advantage of accepting this zone of 
existence and creation, knowing that it is only a tiny little blip emerged from the cosmic zone of infinitude. That's all. So enlightenment, awakening, self, all of these words end up being used in order to elevate a person and put down others. Mm. Now, all of us seek a confirmation experience, a certainty that all is well. And after death, your destiny is even better than anything well. There's no longer any interference in it of outside agencies. The weather, the people, the change and COVID. So we are all seekers of assurance and experience of a destiny or a future that is ever perfect, each one of us. And that we can in a way touch upon uh, uh, the more frequently we can enter into the zone of total, utter silence at every level. And then you'll, you'll, you'll find this world itself is a preparation for that which comes after death. So everybody will be enlightened. So that is why there is divine justice. It isn't that only a few people, handful here and three or four on top of Tibet or somewhere. It's not fair. We are all created equal in the eye of God. We will also die as equal in the eye of God. The inequality is the stupidity of each one of us of thinking I can do this independently, I can do it better than that, and we enter into competition and it ends up being, you know, so-called religious or spiritual competition. The mercy is that every soul knows the infinite essence from which it has emerged. Every soul knows that. But do I know my soul? I'm encumbered by my mind, by my biography, by my fears, my anxieties, my concerns, my desires, my phobias. So I have got 50 different screens between me and the brilliant light of my own soul. So I don't see it. So the whole idea of religious practices, kindness, humane, all of the other humanity values that we as human beings all of us, amazingly, all of us, consider to be good, takes us to the edge of humanity which touches upon our inner divinity. That's as far as anybody can go. Then you understand other people's weaknesses, needs, limitations, anger, uh, whatever it is, they are cursing you. You understand they are cursing you because it's unfamiliar to them and you interjected something that is threatening if you like their security and their existence. So of course they are, they're threatening. So you, it's out of place, out of context. The, then that is wisdom. From wisdom comes appropriate judgment. Don't tell people what that is going to frighten them. Although it may be the truth in your mind and in some other wise people's mind, but in their mind, it is anathema. So don't do it unless you want sensationalism. If you want mm. sensationalism, as some of our stupid leaders do, fine, do it. That's, that's also fine. <laughs> but it's due to you want it to be a, the center of attraction <laughs> rather than a goodness, a good element along the movement on the human caravan towards higher consciousness, which it has been doing for millions of years. Higher consciousness, higher consciousness. The ultimate consciousness is unified consciousness, the absolute, the infinite, the quantum, and the finite, the tiny little issue of day-to-day -day life and communication, connection. So both of them are together. And intelligence takes you swiftly through that, if you like, amazing spectrum. From the moment, who are you facing? Somebody with a gun in your head, so as you, unless you say something, or you're facing the knowledge in your own heart of the infinitude of your own soul. Vast spectrum. All of it is in each one of us. That's why each one of us harbors the most sacred, if you like, temple ever. 
which we call for as a metaphor, your heart. It's the heart is the home of your spirit or soul. It's sacred. It has to be kept pure. All kinds of anger, rancor, jealousy, fear, all of them will tarnish the light or will obstruct the light that is emitted from your soul. Equally, the mind has to be constantly put into the practice to be clear, to be rational, to understand, put things in perspective, and so on. But the heart is the essence from which you and I derive our life. And that is endless. But once it becomes me, I've confined it into space and time, then it's not endless. It has a beginning and an end like everything else. But in truth, that light which gives me life is eternal. Once I know my life is not separate from eternal life, then it's no longer even a temporary relief. It is what you may call enlightenment. Then I have no other fear except the autonomic one, preserving the body. Other than that, it doesn't matter. I welcome, I celebrate the end of this journey because it's the beginning of a much more magnificent journey because it's boundless. It is a zone where there is no time or space. Thank you, Sheikh Fadlala. And I think the next question actually uh, relates to that. Margaret uh, writes, our current state is a manifestation of our human collective expression, which is driving the collapse of the soul connection. She writes, how do we return to the place of soul connection when we are bombarded by the negativity of control. And although trying to move beyond this three-dimensional narrative, we keep getting sucked in, dot, dot, dot. So I like the dot, dot, dot she puts at the end, but uh, this ongoing cycle of being drawn in. Depends which side you're on. If you are suffering from the bombardment, then of course you complain and you're most of the time attracted to people who reflect that also magnify it. In other words, they are also suffering like you. Or you look at it from the other point of view. They said, this is only to remind you, don't come here. You'll be bombarded. Use your intelligence as a screen. Don't enter into that zone. You have already suffered from a lot of useless nonsense, if you like, lies, lie, lie that which doesn't last. It's only a temporary. But we are all seeking a reality, a state that is constant, perpetual, eternal. And so you won't enter into that zone. You won't be bombarded. Why should it affect you? But if you allow yourself because you have space and time and boredom, then, and you are looking and seeking, then the chances is 50-50. You fall into a, a zone that also a lot of people hope, pray, wish, but they are in, 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 not on a path that's going to lead them to their inner reality and core itself. <clears throat> Everything in nature reveals itself. Truth is self-effulgent. Lies mm -hmm. which are the covers for the truth, and in fact they indicate the truth, will vanish. They change, they morph, and on and on and on. So once you have experienced that before, through higher intelligence, if you allow it to kick in, it tells you don't do it. But because we are active, we are seeking, seeking, seek. Stop seeking. Your own soul seeks you. Stop. Who's running after you? Stop it. Die now. Practice death. It's the most wonderful experience. Silence in every way is the most glorious, joyful experience. If you can do it, go into any technique you know and vanish. Lose yourself by grace of your soul. That's all what it is. We are here being prepared for another zone of consciousness that has engulfed the incumbencies that we have of body and all its needs and energy and mind. No identity. Because now you have submerged yourself by will and divine grace 
into cosmic reality itself. That's all. Been done. Thy, thy will shall be done. That's it. That is, if you like, God's will is to be at one with the one. And you can only do it by turning away from the twos. The you this and the you that and the you aware and the you defending and offending. These are necessary as part of childish life. But once you reach a point of sufficient reflectiveness, and the soul in you, which is not yours, but you belong to it, and it is cosmic, and it has nothing other than perfection. That's it. And I suppose as a, a concluding question, Sheikh Fadlala, to try to, in my mind, tie it all together. We live in a time, a moment of great individual and collective anxiety. We have the pandemic, we have the hottest year on record, I guess, 2020, and uh, you know, people are worried about civil war in the US and Europe breaking out. I could go on and on, but uh, on the other hand, as someone said to me, it's only in the last 50 years that the planet has become aware through us that it needs to survive. So we have these things going on in the world around us. And I suppose there's also this impulse in people, in many people to say, I would love to step out of that into this timeless zone, but it's, a, it's almost as if people feel they're abandoning ship, that somehow it's difficult to let go when you, in the midst of so much conflict. I, I feel as if that's a theme running through a lot of this, and it's a theme drawing people to Yuval Harari. And um, I, I know that's not true. I guess I would conclude by saying, but I don't know how to articulate it in a way that gives people an understanding that, that all of this, this personal separation from duality and everything you're talking about is uh, in fact uh, a form of service perhaps. Uh, I, I'm, I'm trying to explore even what my question is, but do you understand what I'm struggling with at least? Yes, I, I understand it, I won't join. Of course, <laughs> I, I would hope not. <laughs> you, know, I, you are quite right. I appreciate your <laughs> honesty and your sincerity to, to the cause that we call human quest. It is natural. Uh, life has been moving so fast in the last few billion years from basic, if you like, mysterious way of showing itself awareness of itself, uh, a semi-permeable cell suddenly becomes self-aware. It's the most amazing phenomena. And then it moves and moves, perpetuates, develops, move, until after billions of years, we have this amazingly complex being, the human being, with the most complex you know, physiology, biology, anatomy, and all of that, and this awareness of awareness of awareness. It's the most magnificent story. A few thousand years ago, we wouldn't have survived had we not been collective, collective, collective. Bands of people, maybe altogether 100 million of them, if any, going back, say, 20, 30,000 years ago, hugging the coastal lines, surviving, eating, moving, and resting between 10, 20, and maybe up to 70, 80, 100 people. So there were a few bands of people surviving. It had to be collective. Mm. There was no individuality. You couldn't, like the ants. There's no individuality. We were of that consciousness. We, we, we either all live or we all die, that sort of thing. But as time went on with agriculture, with so-called security of a built-up home and all of the other things that has come very rapidly, in the last few hundred years. And then to cap it all, these amazing uh, phenomena of industrial revolution, agricultural revolution, this, 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 and all of the other. And then now the electronic age we are living in, it has given us 
undue levels of illusions of protection and, and individuality and so on. So I think we are now at the pinnacle of individuality. And we were, up to maybe four or five hundred years ago, at the pinnacle of collectiveness. Now, individuality will only lead us to, not back to the collective, it will, can only lead us to the vertical, to the light in, that you are not individual, you're not alone. In fact, you are not who you think you are. You are here alive because of a divine light in you. So it will take us from the horizontal of the collective to the vertical of disappearing from the so-called you and understanding, awakening to the real soul or spirit in you. So this is where, where I think we are. We are entering into that peak situation, but the memory of the collective is there. It was nice to have an aunt, to have a grandmother you can run up to and hug, and there is no more. That era is finished. The grandmother will reject you if she was there. Say, so go away, wake up to who you are. <laughs> so it has changed. We have to read the overall situation in our little world and our human, if you like, journey in it. Without collectiveness, we would not have survived a few hundred years ago. Now, without getting out of this illusion of independence, individual, me, 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 into the it, 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 light, 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 then again we will collapse. So I think we are at a crossroad again now. We have managed to survive, evolve, grow too fast, over, if you like, populating the world. But now the only way is to awaken to the truth that there is only that truth. And if we don't abide by it, we are at the end of our own, if you like, survival on this earth. Well, Sheikh Fadlala, first of all, I want to thank everyone who asked uh, questions and I, I hope I did those questions justice. I want to thank the squirrels on your roof, who I understand were dropping acorns and giving us some percussion accompaniment. And most of all, I want to thank you once again for a very enlightening discussion and for taking the time. My deep gratitude to you. Thank you. Thank you. I enjoyed it very much. Really. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Muna Abbas, Basit, Zahir, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sheikh Fadlala. Thank you, uh, Richard Esco, all the way from the States at an ungodly hour, probably for you. But every hour is godly. As Sheikh Fadlala's discussions with you today have shown us, wow, where is it that God's face is not? Every moment is sacred and we are all enveloped uh, in that divinity. And I just hope and pray that these kinds of conversations can kind of snap us out of our somnambulance and wake us up into the fact that we are embedded in something far more effulgent and magnificent and mind-blowing really than we can ever put into words or concepts or theorize about. Thank you for expanding our hearts and our minds today. Thank you so much. Salam alaikum. Goodbye.